God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I think ever since I first became a believer, I remember always enjoying engaging people in conversation. Uh, people who don't know about Christ or people who are skeptics or cynics or atheists. And I remember at one time, Tammy and I were, we were taking one for the team. We were going on a mission trip. It's, a, it's all the way to England. <laughs> but we were, we, were in the, we were in the airport and we had a team of about 16 or 17 people. And um, while we were waiting for our flight, I saw these young guys. And they had these long, well actually I think they were short sleeve because it was warm out. They were white shirts, very crisp, button down shirt, their collar was, was done right, and they had black badges on. And I noticed that their badge said Elder on it. And so, you know, being a young Bible major, I, I went up to them and I said, well you know, that's pretty amazing. Maybe you could explain to me why that says Elder. And as far as I can tell, you all are too young to be married. And, 1 Timothy chapter 3 says that an elder uh, is to be the husband of one wife. So maybe you can explain it to me. Next thing I know, I'm completely surrounded. And in fact, my team that we were going with could be nowhere to be found. And I'm surrounded by this group. Um, and it was an excellent exchange. And I enjoyed it. And to this day, man, I love talking with people uh, on Facebook through Twitter, uh, talking with people who are non-believers and try to share the good news with them. And maybe that's why the passage that Mike just read is one of my favorite chapters from the book of Acts. Because here you have the Apostle Paul, and he is talking with people, uh, engaging culture where they are, engaging the people with the good news of Jesus. If you haven't had a chance, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Now, Paul is in the city of Athens which at that time was the intellectual capital of the world. You know, today we're impressed. If you see someone on the news and they're from MIT or they're from Harvard or they're from some Ivy League school, instantly they have credibility, right? And we think, oh, these people are experts. Well, Paul is in Athens. I mean, this is the place that today, not very popular, right? This past week they, they got another multi-billion dollar bailout. <laughs> Uh, we don't think very highly of Greece, it seems like, uh, in the news today. But at that time, this is where democracy is birthed. This is where we learn about language and poetry and Homer and all the classics. So Athens is a very important place for all of world history. And there's Paul. And, and he looks around the city. He's waiting for Silas and Timothy to catch up. And he looks around the city and the text says, that he sees it's full of idols. His heart is provoked. He's stirred up within. He sees all of the idolatry that fills the city, and he's upset. And so he starts to go into the synagogues. Why? Because that's where the religious people are. He's going to talk to them about the gospel. And it says he's also in the marketplace. So he's just, wherever there are people, wherever he can engage in conversation, so they hear him. And they say, well, I wonder what this babbler has to say. That's an interesting word. It means seed spitter. It, it comes from the idea of chickens going around in the field and, and getting a mouthful of seeds and spitting them out. So it's like talking to someone who doesn't make any sense because the words are coming out all jumbled. We, we would like to hear what this babbler has to say. And so Paul ends up with two of the most influential philosophical groups of the day, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Now, the Stoics were started by a guy named Zeno. And uh, he thought that the best way to live life was not to let emotions get in the way, because if you let emotions rule, you're going to make bad judgments. But he, but he thought that people should live, um, well, happy lives, virtuous lives, and make good judgments, but be serious all the time. And the Epicureans, they thought that life was achieved, the best life, by enjoying pleasure. Not like a hedonist where you overindulge, but by controlling your desires. Because overindulgence leads to what? Upset stomach, hangover, regrets. And so here's who Paul is talking with. 
uh, people who want to limit their desires. And some of these people are still influential today. So the first spiritual truth I find in this passage, when Paul looks around the city, he's provoked because the city is full of idols. Troubled hearts. Troubled hearts are activated hearts. Have you met anyone that, oh man, I'm so upset about the rebel flag. I'm so upset about Donald Trump. I'm so upset about Planned Parenthood. They're, they're upset about things. And, and then they sit around and, and all they do is, what? Complain and voice their grievance. Oh, I'm so upset about these things. I'm really mad. I don't like what's going on in the world. The world's changing. I don't like it. A truly troubled heart is an activated heart. Because Paul sees the danger of the idolatry, and he knows where that eventually leads. And so he engages the people where they are. The passage also reminds us that Christianity and the truth of Christianity can stand unashamedly in the marketplace of ideas. Here's Paul with the intellectual elite of the day. They don't necessarily believe in an afterlife. They're not going to deny it. The Stoics and the Epicureans, they're not going to say, oh, we don't really believe in God, but the gods don't seem to be too involved with us. They don't seem to be too powerful. And here they are, influence, influencing, influencing, ugh, influencing all of culture for thousands of years. And Paul doesn't get up and say, boy, all I really have is my Bible. I wish I had something a little more solid to talk to you about. Uh, maybe I shouldn't engage in conversation. He stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. He's not embarrassed of the good news. He's not embarrassed of the scriptures. You know, whether it's Darwinism, relativism, atheism, we don't have to back down. Scriptures are constantly being verified. Archaeologists today, even at this point in time, are still finding ancient kingdoms that are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, stones and monuments dedicated to people who are named in Scripture that for a long time, people say, oh, those people don't really exist. We have textual evidence, you know. You think of things like the Dead Sea Scrolls or um, other ancient manuscripts that are found. I mean, the scriptures are constantly being verified, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. But perhaps more importantly, the passage also reminds us that when we meet people to interact with them, we also have to kind of know a little bit of where they're coming from. So look at verse 22, Acts 17, verse 22. Paul, standing in the midst of the Aragopagus, says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Basically, they're covering their bases. They've got all of these Greek and Roman gods, and they're going to make sure that they worship them. But just in case they miss one, they have this unknown God. What you therefore worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life to all mankind, life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet He's actually not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. You know what's amazing? Here's Paul in Athens, and he never quotes the Bible. This little sermon that's there, there's no book, chapter, and verse. Are there allusions to the Old Testament? Absolutely. One man, who would that be? Adam, right? You talk about from one man, you know, God has created all mankind. And he talks about different attributes of God, different characteristics of God. But he didn't use the Bible. Why? They're not going to accept the authenticity or the authority of Scripture. But maybe that's something for us to consider. We don't compromise our beliefs. We don't change our morals. We don't change our values. We don't change who we are. 
But if the audience you're talking to does not accept the Scriptures, why would you use the Scriptures? And Paul doesn't. And in fact, not only does he not quote Scripture, he quotes two of their poets. It might be like, you know, quoting Tupac. He was a poet. You know, I might want to quote a movie. I might want to touch something culturally that people know. So, in other words, we need people where they are so that we may bring them where they need to be. We meet people where they are so that we can bring them where they need to be. Uh, I love the movie Bruce Almighty. I know it's an older movie. Who's seen Bruce Almighty? You know, that movie has one of the most biblical stances I have ever seen. When at the, the final conclusion of Bruce trying to take on God's um, responsibilities, he falls down on his knees in that rainstorm and he just surrenders. I give up. I can't do it. That's a pretty biblical position there. So maybe I want to quote something like uh, Interstellar. It's a great movie. Not a biblical movie. It has a lot of spiritual truths in it. Prometheus, have you seen Prometheus a couple of years ago? Oh, man. You've got a person who's a believer wearing a cross, arguing for faith. You've got a scientist arguing for blind science. Uh, so maybe that's a good starting point. Not necessarily the Bible. In other words, it calls for sensitivity to the needs of others beyond my own interests, beyond my own desires. It takes a little bit of work, but being in tune with others is probably the only way they're going to tune in with us. I guess it probably means that we deal with people based on their maturity level, not where we expect them to be. I think maybe Christianity takes on some laziness when we place more expectations on people than we do our own personal responsibilities for meeting them where they are. Well, if you're waiting for something to tweet or post on Facebook this week, um, you, I used to say if you're a note taker, take notes at this point. Um, but if you're looking for something, here's, here's an idea I want to share. And this hit me this week as I was going over this passage. And it was like a thunderbolt. I, I read this over and over. In fact, what I do for my sermon as I'm preparing it is I print off the text that I'm going to preach on. And I've got a little notebook that I carry with me. And I have Walmart receipts too. Yeah. So I carry this notebook with me and I print off the sermon and I pull up, I put it in here. And then as I have ideas that come to me, I write them down so I don't lose them. Because it's hot out there in that sun and sometimes you don't always think clearly. And so here's a thought that hit me. As I looked at Paul's example, we need to talk about the judgment to come without becoming judgmental. Let me say that one more time. Here. We need to talk about the judgment to come without becoming judgmental. What's one thing we know about the Greek gods? They were horrible. You know, Zeus comes down, gets women pregnant, and then you have Hercules. You know, they were lusty. They were combative. They were not gods worth worshiping or following. Paul certainly could have said, you're a bunch of reprobates, a bunch of drunken gluttons. Man, let me tell you what, if you don't come to me and hear the message I have, ooh, I feel the flames. I smell something burning. Because you're on your way to hell. Paul doesn't do that. He never judges them, not once. He is able to articulate clearly. There is a coming judgment. Verse 30. The times of ignorance, right? In the past, God overlooked them, but now He commands that all people everywhere need to repent because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He have appointed. And He has given this assurance by raising Him from the dead. He talks about the judgment and He gives them hope. We need to talk about the judgment without becoming judgmental. You don't have to send people to hell to talk about heaven. Paul doesn't condemn them. Yes, without Jesus Christ, 
Everyone is lost. But hammering them over the head isn't going to drive the point home. And that's why I carry a big Bible. Let them hit them, right? It's not what happens. And maybe you're saying, well, I'm not that comfortable talking to people about Jesus. I'm no Paul. I'm no apostle. I'm no preacher. I'm no teacher. I want to tell people about the good news, but I'm not very confident right now. Well, I've got a tool for you. I'm going to leave them over here by the communion table. In this bag. Believe it or not, it's a way to help introduce people to the gospel without even saying a word. I'm going to leave it over here. And I've got about, I don't know, 50 of these in here. And what I'd like you to do, if you don't really feel like, hey, I'm at a point where I can engage someone by talking to them, to start a new season. And you just hang it on their door. On the back side, it talks a little bit about new songs. Our website's on here. It talks about where we meet. All you got to do is go to your neighbor. You know, I got to tell you real quick. It doesn't always work out and invite your neighbor to church. You know, we live kind of in the middle of the subdivision. And uh, the house next door to us was for sale. And an older couple, which, you know, the longer I live, the less older couples I meet. Yeah. So older couple moves in, and I'm changing the oil on the car. Maybe that was where my first mistake was to talk to him. Dressed like I'm changing the oil on the car. And I went over and I shook his hand. I'm like, hey man, I'm Craig. How you doing? Good to meet you. Hey, you have a church? No, you don't. Oh man. Well, I'd love to invite you. So I invite the church, and you know what? Next thing I know, the house is on the market. They move. So <laughs> maybe inviting people to church isn't always the best way, but. If you're saying, man, I want to share the good news, but right now, I'm not very confident to talk. There's a great tool. Invite your neighbor. So Paul's starting point. He looks around, and he sees the idols. And he tells them, you're very religious, which would be complimentary for them. Hey, I recognize you're trying to be spiritual people, and you're worshiping all these other things. So he affirms them. He doesn't criticize them. He doesn't mock them. He doesn't... Judge them. Maybe that's a good example for us. Right there in the midst of the intellectual elite of the world of the day. The philosophers. And he, he presents something very profound. It would be really hard to memorize. The death, burial, resurrection. They think he's talking about two different gods, by the way. Did you catch that at the beginning of the passage? These strange deities? Because he's preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. He doesn't quote the Bible. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't demean them. But he warns them. He gives them hope. And then he goes on from that starting point of making those observations. And he doesn't wait for them to find him. If you're looking for something else to tweet this week, let me give you one more. I'm just about done here. This is a tough one. I don't know if you're going to accept it very well. You love me, right, Betty? Oh. <laughs> so I could say something that might be unpopular. Stand by, Betty. <laughs> say what? I said, stand by, Betty. Stand by, Betty. <laughs> Betty's got my back. you got to go through her to get to me. We have to start going to people because they're not going to come to us. You know, 50 years ago... Being an American meant you were a Christian. People value you. Going to gospel meetings, going to church meetings, attending church. And you could build a building, you could paint whatever denominational sign you wanted over it, you could open the doors and, and people would what? They would come to you. We don't live in that day anymore. We don't live in a time where you just, let me put my marquee out there, let me put my sign out there, let me... If you build it, they will come. It doesn't work that way anymore. We have to start going to people because they're not going to knock down the doors of the church. Oh, you know God. Help me out. People don't know they're lost. We have a lot of idolatry around us today. You know, Paul is looking at real marble statues of Zeus 
of, you know, Hermes. I can see him right now up on the hill. He's looking at him. He's provoked in his heart. We've got four idols today that people worship. Beauty, brains, bucks, and brawn. I know it because I see the religious literature every time I go through the grocery line. There's Cosmopolitan. There's People Magazine. The religious propaganda for people who worship beauty. That's an idol, believe it or not. Brains that, oh, when you have a PhD, you're so smart. I, I should fall down and just worship at your feet. I'm not against I'm not against education. Amen? Follow me. I'm not against education. I graduated from high school. I'm all for <laughs> Zach, what did you used to tell kids? Do you remember when you were about 10 or 12, you would joke? My dad was an ordained internet minister. <laughs> Um, I believe in education, but I don't believe it's something we worship. Well, Jesus said you can't serve money and God and strength. You know, Rodney's a, a gym rat, but I know that you love the Lord more than you do the gym. Amen. You can do both, can't you? But I know that there's people. I was one of them before we became a believer. I was in the gym five days a week. Three hours a night. I skipped kids' birthday parties to go to the gym. So you can't tell me anything I don't know about that being a false god. So let me finish with this. To speak of the coming judgment without becoming judgmental, that honors God. That, that leads people to eternal life. So may we meet people where they are so that we can lead them where they need to be. Would you pray with me, please?